Roman Catholics. They thought the Roman Catholics were going to corrupt American society, and the Pope was going to tell everybody what to do instead of Americans having freedom. This should sound familiar to you, because this is the way people talk about Islam today, that people want Sharia law, and so we're going to lose our freedoms. Um, so anyway, the, the, these, these, these exclude, the Immigration Act of 1924, the Johnson-Reed Act, was really put in place to prevent immigration very specifically from Eastern Europe and Southern Europe. And it just so happened that it also cut off, really, almost all immigration from the Middle East. So we went from this period with lots of people coming to America to a period where there was really almost a freeze on immigration from the Arab world. There were exceptions. There were family, There were 100 visas a year that were given to Syrians. So that's, just, that's not immigration. <laughs> that's a trickle. Uh, it can make a difference, but not a real difference. So, so this is why we had this period of uh, where the community, without all this new immigration, it had an easier time Americanizing, right? Because you know all the kids who were born were born here. You know, just became a so. So we had sort of this melting pot generation that took place in the 1930s and 40s. But here's what you know. This is the the, the picture on the left is an English class, an Americanization class that took place in the courtyard of the Ford Motor Company. And so they gave people that $5 work day, but in exchange you had to study English. Imagine studying English like that. Thousands of people lined up in a row. You can't see the details of the picture, but they had like, you know, they would just hold up cards like teapot, and then they would hold one up soap, you know, shampoo. It wasn't, you know, a really vibrant English class. This is a smaller English class. So the city of Detroit was just really obsessed with trying to provide Americanization services. The Ford Motor Company was also, if you wanted that $5 workday, they were very disciplinary. You had to live in the way they wanted you to live. So they would go into someone's house, like the one on the left, and they would say, no, this isn't clean enough. You have to have curtains in your windows. You have to eat healthy food. You know, very often healthy food to the Americans. Imagine anything healthier than the Lebanese diet. There's nothing healthier than the Lebanese diet. But they would say to the Lebanese, no, you know, this smells funny. You have to, no garlic. This is, you know, something like that. They were always trying to reform people in their practices. This, again, should be a bigger picture. I'm used to a much bigger um, projector. You guys remember the, the, this is actually a picture of a melting pot. So the Ford workers, after working for the factory for a certain amount of time and after studying English, if they passed the English test, the workers would actually march into the melting pot wearing their traditional clothing from whatever country they come from and holding a flag, like a, a Syrian flag, a Polish flag, or whatever. They would go into the melting pot, and the teacher had a big ladle, and the teacher would stir the pot. And then the people would walk out wearing workers' clothing. They were Americans, holding American flags. So it's really to sort of give you an idea of how serious America was in this period about sort of, you know, getting people to conform to a certain type of Americanness. So the, the immigrants who came here from the Middle East really were at a disadvantage in this period. So if you think about why did the community come here and then not grow, it's because it really wasn't, you know, new immigration couldn't come. So you had uh, legislative, legislative uh, discrimination that kept new people from coming to America. You had judicial uh, discrimination which kept the Jim Crow system in, in place for people from the from African American community. And you also had a kind of discursive uh, discrimination, which was anti-immigrant in this period, it was sort of uh, felt a, a estranged from Islam in particular. So if you talk to people in the 1920s, their idea about Muslims was the Turks and the Armenian Genocide. And that's, that's, that's what people knew about Islam in this period. So there was hostility and fear in this period too, not, not what we're facing today. But all of these things work together to keep the community from really growing effectively, to keep people from becoming citizens. And also, the, the Syrian community in this early period was very committed to uh, creating independence of their own land. So there were a lot of the early Syrian associations were very concerned with the Middle East, uh, especially they wanted Syrian independence. They did not want the French and the British to divide up the Arab world. And they even went so far as to say, if we're gonna, if we're gonna have a colonial power over rule over Lebanon or Syria at the time, we want it to be the United States, not France or England. Because we know history didn't quite work out that way. So, um, so this is what, so, so all those Muslims who were working in Highland Park together, while there were these ethnic communities, uh, there were also, they worked together across their cultural differences. So you saw Indian Muslims uh, worshiping with Arab Muslims, working with, worshiping with Turkish Muslims, and they were trying to build like a Muslim enclave. 
And the first thing they did was they built coffee houses. This should be familiar for anybody who grew up in Dearborn. You know, the South End had had a bunch of coffee houses. They built mutual aid societies so they could bury their dead, so they could uh, help their kids get married, send people home. They built ethnic clubs. There's a story about Mike Berry being in a 4th of July parade in Highland Park. I can't remember the year. But the Syrian club in that parade was the biggest ethnic club that participated in that parade. Uh, they had national associations, newspapers, right? But a lot of these associations were gendered. The coffee house was a male space. The ethnic club was a male space. So uh, people used to work at worship in each other's homes. Sometimes they would worship in the coffee house. But the coffee house wasn't good enough. The thing that made the Syrian community different from all those other Muslim communities is the Turks came here just as men. The Lithuanians came here just as men. But the Syrians came here as families, right? So those families really wanted their kids to learn Arabic. They really wanted to celebrate the holidays together, right? So one of the first things they did was they built this mosque. This was the first mosque built as a mosque in the United States. It wasn't the first one to exist, but it was the first one. This was one block away from the entrance to that Highland Park factory. Uh, it was built by the Karub family, the Karub brothers, Mohammed Karub and Hussein Karub, and they also had a lot of assistance from Khalil Bazi, who was the man on the left in that picture. So that's the opening day parade in 1921. They came together, they worshiped together, they built a mosque together. This was in Highland Park in 1921. Uh, this is a funeral. This picture was given to me by Hajj Kamal. Uh, of the funeral the, in Highland Park. I love it because it's got men and women in it, it's got children, uh, and it's also got like, a, you know, the, both the Syrian flag and the American flag, and it also has the American, you know, graveyards in that period used to have American bands that would come and play music for the funeral. So it was like a real mix of ceremonies. The picture on the right was taken in Salina Elementary School in 1923. So this shows you that the community started moving here Really, so this is the second mosque that opened in Detroit. This one was on, um, on uh, hmm, why can I think of the name of the street? Uh, it was in the heart of Black Hawk, the neighborhood that became Black Hawk. Uh, this was the Universal Islamic Society. Again, the man leading the prayer here is Khalil Bezzi. And so you can see in this period, Khalil Bezzi was a religious activist. He was also a political activist. He was the, the Detroit delegate to the new Syria party, which was a Syrian nationalist uh, organization here. And the two other people who were sort of the co-founders of this organization, one of them was the man who's hugging in the picture on the right, a Sudanese British subject, and the other one was a South Asian man, Shah al -Abedin. So they were, they were coming together like we're, we're, we're colonial subjects of France and Africa and India and in the Middle East, of France and England, and we want our independence. That was the thing that brought them together. So Islam was a, was a unifying force for them back in this period. Um, but, you know, Really, almost as soon as Henry Ford opened his factory in Highland Park, he started realizing that the city of Detroit was constraining him. He opened that factory in Highland Park, and the Dodge brothers opened their factory in Hamtramck, like on the border of Hamtramck and Detroit, and the idea was they were trying to get away from the city council of Detroit and how the city was trying to dictate everything to them, where to put their railroad lines, to make them pay more taxes and stuff like that. So as soon as Henry Ford got his factory going, he started doing this. He started building this right here. This was a picture taken of the Ford Rouge plant in 1927. So he started investing in the Rouge plant, bought up all this land in the area. Uh, here he could build, there were over 300 miles of railroad line that came in and out of the factory. He got the federal government to dredge the Detroit River for him. You know, all this stuff was happening. He had, uh, you know, over a mile of, you know, factory. It was a huge production. And of course, Arabs followed Henry Ford to Dearborn. They came here, they helped him build the factory, and they started building houses in the neighborhood just beyond the factory, which is the south end of Dearborn. So, yeah, so there were, um, in 1920, there were 57,000 workers in Highland Park, but 10 years later, there were over 100,000 in River Rouge itself. And that's why I have this slide, to really show you how quickly these communities were growing. Just look at that, imagine living in Highland Park in 1910, and 10 years later, the population was 40, you know, it was, it was a village of 4,000, now it has 47,000. Look at Dearborn, it went from 2,500 people in 1920 to 50,000 people 10 years later. Imagine, you know, this was why so many of the houses that we see in, in Dearborn are all built in the 1920s or the 1930s, so this was, the, this was when the city was being built. 
And Arab Americans, we think of Arabs as having been factory workers, and they were in this period. But they also built their own houses in the neighborhood, and a lot of them made money off of this real estate. The, the, the way that they were able to pay for that first mosque in Highland Park was Mohammed Karoub sold, or he bought a piece of property at the beginning of World War I, and he sold it at the end of World War I, and he made a fortune. So he, he got out of the factory, and he just started buying and selling real estate. And so the Arab community has always been involved both in the you know, labor, but also really been very active entrepreneurs. So uh, then, of course, we're hit by the Depression. And in the Depression, a lot of Arab Americans go home. They go back to Lebanon. They think, you know, we're going to ride it out there. It'll be easier for us to raise our kids in the village. Um, Again, Mike Berry and his family went home. He was a kid. He'd grown up in the Highland Park Public Schools. He felt like he was getting a great education. They were brand spanking new schools, best teachers, best, you know, best American curriculum that was available. And he went back to the village, and what does he have? He had a teacher with a chalkboard, you know, like a slate for him to write on. And he was so upset because his mom, you know, he and his sister had to go get water from the well so his mom could make bread every morning. You know, for him, this was like a hardship. You know, so a lot of families went back to Lebanon thinking that they were going to be relaxed and easy, but they found that compared to their American lifestyle, it was actually hard to live in Lebanon in this period. So people started coming back when the jobs started coming back. And really, this, uh, this, this mosque right here, Hashmi Hall, was really sort of the start of a new beginning for the Arab community in Dearborn, right? People really, they, you know, families would give a dollar a week or a dollar a week for every person in the family. You know, they really saved their pennies and contributed and worked together very hard to make this institution happen. Hashmi Hall, it was the first mosque in Dearborn. Of course, it had just a few blocks away, you had the American Muslim Society. So you had a Shia mosque and a Sunni mosque. But as uh, Ardella Jabara told me, one of the founders, or, you know, from one of the founding families of the American Muslim Society, she said, we all ate the same Manjandara, you know, which people were from the same place. They had the same customs. One year, once one mosque would have a good Sunday, Sunday school teacher, and all the kids would go to that Sunday school. And then, you know, a few years later, the other mosque would have the good Sunday school teacher, and the kids would go down there. So people went back and forth uh, and helped build up these institutions together. So, you know, this is what Dearborn looked like in the 1930s and 40s and 50s. But this whole generation of people grew up here. They, they grew up, people like Hajj Chuck or Hajj Eid, they grew up in the United States. They wound up going and fighting in World War II. You know, they came home after the war. And if you watch all those of World War II movies,